Caitlin, in Dosed, you've done something that's really quite unique, which is telling the story of this generation of kids who are perhaps the first in large numbers to have grown up taking psychotropic medication from their perspective. How did you get the idea to do that? And how, why and how did that idea come to you? Oh, first of all, thanks so much for having me and interviewing me, Judy. I really appreciate it. Um, the way that I got the idea, I actually read a column in the New York Times that was sort of a case study of a young woman who had spent almost 20 years taking antidepressants. And she was wondering how they had affected her. And the, um, the column mentioned that there was very little research, scientific research, that could talk about the way that these drugs had affected children's development uh, as they're growing up. And so that got me curious. I figured the studies don't exist, but I myself had been taking medications since I was um, a teenager. And I figured there must be huge numbers of people in my position, and I would be really curious to hear their stories and get their take on how it has turned out for them. Did you find that it was a difficult project then to launch forward? You know, we have so much conversation, so much debate, on this subject right now in America, and that's been true actually for, for decades, and you chart that really nicely in your book, how the conversation shaped up, how it's changed over the years, how it has or hasn't dovetailed with changes in scientific knowledge. You were taking what was essentially a very compassionate view from the start, because you were looking to give kids, young adults really now, the people you're talking to, a voice. Did you find that you were up against a lot of preconceived notions in trying to get started, or were you from the start allowed to kind of have a blank slate and move forward? I would say I was not up against my preconceived notions, but I think that there are a lot of societal preconceived notions. And when I was trying to interview experts, one thing that I did find, you know, to get their take on how have medications affected young people as they've grown up and what has been your clinical experience, especially with researchers, it just wasn't an idea that they were accustomed to thinking about because we're so used to debating it in these really binary terms of are kids over medicated or do these drugs work to resolve symptoms, that to get it a more nuanced look at it, like what is the quality of the experience, was a new question. It's true. It's a new question. It's a very fresh question. Did you find that the researchers were happy that you were doing this, or were they sort of stumped by the whole enterprise? It varied. Some of them were, were happy that I was doing it, especially the clinicians were mm -hmm. very happy that I was doing it, and the people who I think did both research and also saw patients on a regular basis thought that it was a good question to ask, and they had indeed um, seen this in their own practice. The researchers uh, were a little more focused on um, what did the studies say? Well, we haven't, we don't have these studies, and they were a little stumped. There are some studies that you pointed to. I mean, very few, strikingly few, given how important a topic this is. Can you just tell me a little bit about those? What does exist? Sure, and I should distinguish between the social science researchers that I was talking to and also the um, working um, scientists. So the scientists, this was sort of not a question that was on their radar screen. But the social scientists, there is a small group of them um, who I think are doing some really fascinating and pioneering work. Um, doing a formal version of what I do in the book, which is to ask young people about the qualitative experience of taking medications and how it has shaped them and shaped their identity. And it wasn't too hard to find them. They were extremely excited that I was exploring this topic, and I was extremely excited that they were exploring this topic because it was great to be able to uh, have a little bit of a larger body of research to draw on. Sure, and it's great to be able to really kind of bring the greater richness to a debate that's really been pretty sterile and that's gone along the same lines for all of these decades. Are kids over medicated? Are they getting kind of quick fix solutions to complicated problems? Um, and it's really fantastic that you took the debate beyond those simple storylines that we've become all too familiar with. I think it's great. Thank now, you, you said that you really didn't go into it with any preconceptions. You had an open mind. I think you had your own concrete experience to draw on that kind of demystified the subject for you in the first place. Can you talk a bit about your own experience and then how this 
led into the project and maybe led you to connect better with the young adults you were interviewing? Sure. So I would say that my depression, um, and in retrospect also my anxiety, although it wasn't identified as such then, um, began when I was about 12 years old. I had a, a very traumatic medical experience wearing a brace for scoliosis. It went very badly. Um, I was having um, trouble socially at school because I was having to leave for medical appointments all the time and it made me very self-conscious about my body. Um, I developed an eating disorder, I think, as a result of some of those body issues, and that was what landed me into therapy when my parents found out about this. Um, I was in therapy for a couple of years, didn't find it to be very useful. They thought that my underlying issues were not the eating disorder, but the depression and the anxiety. But there were only, I lived in a small town, there were only a couple of therapists, there weren't a lot of different methods or options to draw on, and I kept just wishing that there was some other solution. And I had heard about medication, and I knew people who had taken medication, and I knew that it had helped them, and I kept wishing somebody would offer it to me. And nobody did, and so finally I just took the initiative and I talked to my parents and my pediatrician about it myself. And how old were you at that point? By that point, I was 17, but I had been thinking about medication for at least two years. So that's a long time though, 12 to 17, that's a really long time to suffer with anxiety and depression in sort of getting therapy that it sounds like wasn't terribly effective. That's right, and that was another thing that I think made me more confident in my decision to ask for medication. and. I think that distinguishes my experience from some of the experiences that I detail in DOST where the kids were much younger, they didn't get a say in it, they didn't know anything about the medication, um, or and, and didn't even go perhaps for very long being even aware of the way that they were um, impaired, whereas I went for years being acutely aware of this, as I say in the book, writing poetry, <laughs> you know, English poetry, and hoping for a way out. So I, I would draw a distinction, a, a distinction between people who start medication um, at an older age like I did and those who, who begin it much younger. But it sounds also as though you had a really well-developed vocabulary for understanding what you were going through and also a fair bit of knowledge about mental health, about treatment options. What year was this or what years were this while you were going through this? This would have been the late 90s through the turn of the millennium. So we were already pretty well into the Prozac era. There were new SSRIs like Prozac. The descendants, let's say, that had come out on the market, there had been a lot of media reporting around them, which you point out in the book at the beginning was extremely positive, I mean, to the point of jubilant. Um, in retrospect, do you think that that media coverage was helpful? Do you think it gave you unrealistic expectations? I think at the beginning it actually was helpful because it gave me the confidence to ask for a medication that, like I said, nobody was offering to me and that I, I felt that I really needed. In retrospect, when I look at this, um, especially this paradigm of the chemical imbalance, which we've learned is pretty oversimplified and that there are so many factors that really go into these mood and, and behavior disorders, um, I think it did lead me to think that medication would be a quick fix. And it was at first. It worked really well for me for a number of years. And then when it stopped working, it was really a shock. And I think I was not prepared to think that this was going to be a continuing struggle. Were you able to continue therapy or find better therapy over the years once you had had some success with medication? It took me a while. You know, it took until I had had um, a couple of really bad nervous episodes where I was experiencing new symptoms and I felt like I needed something beyond the medication. Um, and also I, I was able to find therapists in the city who I thought were really smart, uh, just really sensitive and had, had a really nuanced take on what I was going through. I think it's important to give people who are watching a sense of the real depth of what you were going through because I think that people tend to see someone who's kind of come out the other end in the sense that you survived, you're together, you're successful, and not understand the real seriousness of the symptoms that lead parents, let's say, to be willing to give their children medication, or in your case, could lead a teenager to want to take medication, which is very unusual. Um, can you talk about that? I mean, we can hear the words depression, anxiety, but in the book, 
you tell the story in a way that makes it very concrete, that allows us to understand beyond just the diagnostic words what the experience really felt like, what your day-to-day -day life was like. I personally felt that I was just slogging along through life. Um, it wasn't as though I